Turning to the Gospel according to Luke and chapter 3, please. Luke's Gospel and the third chapter. And verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, let me just stop there a wee moment and say there were 12 Caesars who ruled over the Roman Empire. Augustus Caesar was the first of them and this here Tiberius Caesar is the second, his son. It says there, in the year, now in the 15th year of the reign, that word reign is a very strong word. It means to have domination and to master, to have full control. You know, there were many of those Caesars who made a bid for world power, but they never made it. Julius Caesar came near to it, but they never got grip of controlling the whole world. But where they failed, the Antichrist will not fail. For he is very shortly going to dominate for a period and control the whole world. There's always been a quest for world power in the heart of man and that comes from the devil. These men were demonic, these Caesars and others, they were demonically driven. But the Antichrist is demonically possessed. He is the devil incarnate. And he for a short time will rule where others couldn't until the Lord deals with him and until the Lord puts him down. So let's hit the verse again. Now in the 15th year of the domination of Tiberius Caesar... Let me just stop again there and say something. Sometimes you read in the Gospels about the Lake of Galilee and the Lake Gennesaret and the Sea of Tiberias. Those are all the Galilean Lake. But the name Tiberias is twice used in the Gospel and it's there because this Roman... Tiberius stamped his name upon the Sea of Galilee. And a part of the Sea of Galilee comes under his name. And then again, you read here, as you read on down, there was Herod being the Tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip. Now, you read also in the Gospel about Caesarea Philippi. Remember, that's where Peter made the great statement acknowledging when Christ asked, who do man say that I am? And Philippi, Philip uh, stamped his name uh, on different places as well. And that's why he call, is called Caesarea Philippi. And I'm saying that in passing to say that the devil always loves to stamp his name on territory that doesn't belong to him. Didn't, be, didn't belong to them. It belonged to God's people. And the land still belongs to God's people tonight. And of course they have stamped their name. The devil has his name over the holy land tonight. Uh, the devil dominates. The Palestinians dominate the West Bank and Bethlehem and part of Jerusalem. And they, the devil will always claim territory. 
And I'm saying that to warn us all tonight that he will claim your child. He will claim your church. He will claim your home. He will claim your family. And we need to stand against him in these days because he'll stamp his name. And once he gets a grip, it's hard to break that grip. And we're going to break that grip in prayer in the days that lie ahead. That's just in passing as we read on these verses because sometimes you read the scriptures and you see about the Sea of Tiberias. Well, that's come from there. Philippi Caesar, that came from there. It comes from these boys. So there you are. That's the way it is. So let's read on then. Let's read the verse again. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea, and Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Laturia, and of the region of Trachonitis and Lysanius, the tetrarch of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, this is John the Baptist speaking, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. And every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? And we know God will bless the reading of his word. Just let's bow in a short moment's prayer, please. Father, we thank thee for the prayer that has ascended and the prayers that have ascended for these meetings and for this meeting tonight. And Lord, we're wholly dependent upon thee. We ask, Lord, that thou will take your word tonight and that thou will reveal it unto us, that we might feed on this uh, manna, that we might feed our souls and bless our souls and be exhorted and comforted or whatever you want to do to us tonight. Lord, we're just open to thee, for we ask these things in the Savior's name and for his sake. Amen. If ever there was a portion of Scripture that describes and depicts and compares the days of Herod, king of Judah, and the days of which we're living in, in Charles the third, the king of England. It's all here in these verses of Scripture. And the verses that follow and the chapters that follow also. Everything is here that we are seeing in these days in which we live, way back in these days, politically, morally, spiritually, evangelically, prophetically, and we could take a night at each of them because all of them appeal and apply to these days. I want to compound our message tonight into three headings. We might take them in order, but by the end of the night we will probably have covered most of it. First of all, tonight we're going to see the reason why the nation and the priesthood was in the dilemma that it was in in Jerusalem at this time. And we need to find the reason, we need to get to the source of 
problems in order that we can solve or try to solve the problem. Secondly, we're going to look at the result of the consequences of the nation and Jerusalem and the temple and the priesthood, the result that came from the state that they were in. And then thirdly, we're going to look at the remedy that God had provided to counteract, to heal, to bless, and to restore the land back again. Now, the first heading my tonight is a very simple one. And to say the reason for the condition, the reason for the confusion, the tyranny, the rulers of these men over God's people, there's only one answer to it, and the answer is sin. S-I-N, sin. That hasn't changed anything. Sin has never changed. It changes never for the better. It always changes for the worse. And also God hasn't changed. He hasn't changed. So the result of the problem that they were in here is because of sin. And because of sin, God had withdrawn from his people. He had departed from them. And they, when he departs from a nation and from a people, they go into oppression, humiliation, slavery, and shame. Because righteousness exalted the nation. The problem is sin, and because of sin, God hid his face from his people. Then the remedy, the remedy is God's word. Sin, first of all, is the reason. Secondly, the result is what I'm after saying to you, is humiliation and slavery. And thirdly, the remedy is the Word of God. And the Word of God came here by the man of God, filled with the Holy Ghost, and that's still the remedy for the situation that we're in today. It's God and God's Word. No other change. The word sin is not in the vocabulary of many today, and sadly, even in the church. It's not in the equation today. Uh, media people, the politicians, are, are not blaming sin for the problem. They, they blame everything else. They have a host of things that they pinpoint and they blame for the state of the nation that we're in. But sin is not mentioned. And sadly, it's not mentioned much in many evangelical churches either as the problem. Social problem, they tell us. My friend, the problem is the problem is sin. That's what it is. Right through the Word of God, the major prophets and the minor prophets, in, in the words of Solomon and in the book of Judges and others, they were all warned, Israel and Judah were warned time and time again that God would withdraw himself he would hide his face from them. He would abandon them because of their iniquity, rebellion, and idolatry. Because a holy and righteous God hates sin. He can't look upon it. He is a pure eyes than to behold iniquity. Even the six hours that our Savior hung upon the cross, bearing our sin, he turned his face away from the cross because of sin, even from his own son. The three and a half years of the famine in the land in the days of Elijah, he hid his face from them for three and a half years because of the idolatry and the sin of the nation. For 40 years in the wilderness, they wandered in Kadesh Barnea. He turned his face, he withdrew, he withdrew, he hid himself because of their idolatry and their wickedness, their rebellion and their sin. Seventy years he brought them into the Babylonish captivity because of their sin. He hid his face. And 400 years, from Malachi to Matthew, the 400 silent years, here we are again, and God has hidden his face from his people because of sin. Now, whenever are we going to get this message into our heart that God hates sin? And something new is not going to solve the problem. It's not going to be rescued and salvaged by 
political people or economical people or anybody else. It will only be solved by God when we get things right into the place that we should. Not new morality. They're talking about new morality and new ideas and so forth. My friend, the only answer to this, to turn God's face again to his people, is repentance that you'll see and the turning back to God when the people submit before God. So the reason is the same. The result is the same. And the remedy is the same. Modernism, humanism, liberalism, all abroad today is doing nothing and will do nothing to bring our nation, to bring our country, to bring our church back into line with God. 2,800 years ago, the evangelical prophet Isaiah made an awesome statement in Isaiah chapter 5. You needn't turn to it. But here's what he said in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. And you ask yourself, are we living? Are we not living in the days that Isaiah made this statement? Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Woe to them that put darkness for light and light for darkness. Woe unto them who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What an awesome statement. Listen to it today. It's good, they say to us, for the life of the mother and child and for society as a whole that the child should be aborted. That's good, they say. How could it be good to kill a child? How could it be good to gouge into a mother's womb and penetrate and stab a child that it can feel its pain? It's evil. It's wicked. It's barbaric. It's pagan. And they tell us it's light. We are an enlightened generation now. An enlightened generation that murder, murder thousands and thousands of children every week. How would that be light? It's darkness of the highest order and it's darkness, demonic darkness. That's the day we're in. Then they say, it's lightened, we're enlightened. It's good now that, uh, to allow six or seven year olds or above to cho- choose their own identity and their own gender. It's a good thing. We must listen to them. If they say they're a boy and he's a girl and a girl they're a boy, we must listen to them and we must facilitate them. And we must educate them in the way that they're going. And if their parents interfere with them, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, not allow them in there. We'll, we'll take them into care. And we'll remove the parents from them. How would that be late? How could that be good? It's nothing, my friend, but pure, utter evil coming from hell. Let them try and experiment, they say now, on same-sex relationship. It's good. It's good for the child. It's good for the young people. How, my friend, could anybody with an ounce of common sense say that something like that is good when it's wicked and it's evil? And then they're saying to the Talus, and this has gone on, of course, for years, to cohabitate and not to get married uh, to, mar- to, 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 to marry is good. Good to see how things go for a while, and if you don't like it, then you can leave it. It's evil. It's fornication, and the Bible says, and in many cases it's adultery. adultery. And we're talk, they're talking about these things are enlightening, they're a new age, they're, they're a great thing, they're a good thing. It's a good thing the Church of England says that we marry and ordain the same-sex people. Contrary completely to the Word of God. Yeah, and they say, if it's good if a marriage doesn't work to divorce. 
and we make it easy for you. If your husband snores five nights in a row, and you bring a, a, a camera in and you can hear him snore, and then you can get a divorce. If he doesn't feed the dog and the cat at the right time of the day, you get a divorce. This is what's going on in our society today. Now, I, I say about divorce, there are exceptions, and we're not going into that tonight. But my friend, these people that are coming out with this stuff that we're listening to every day and it's pounded down our throat every day and we daren't open our mouth hardly. These are not ignorant people. These are not morons. These are professors. These are people with PhDs. The academia, the, the, the scientists. The ones who told us to stay in our houses and put masks on so they nearly smothered us and killed thousands. Suffocated us. These, 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 are, these are wise, supposed to be. Paid. These are professors. But their foolish hearts, Paul said, is darkened. Professing themselves to become wise, they become fools. I'm glad that these, hidden, these things are hidden from the wise and prudent. They're hidden from the, uh, and they're revealed unto the wise and prudent. They're hidden from, hidden from the, from, from the, and revealed unto babes. I mightn't know very much, but I know this. I know, I know the difference in evil and good. And if I didn't have the Bible to tell me that, I'd know in my own conscience what's evil and what's good. And so would you. And I, I'm not that smart, but I know the difference in day and night. I would know when I'd walk out there, whether it's daylight or whether it's dark. I wouldn't call it dark now if I walked out. If I walked out there and said, it's very, very dark tonight, you'd say that man's not well. And I know what's bitter and I know what's sweet. And I know that if you take a mouthful of vinegar, it's bitter. And if you take a spoonful of sugar, it's sweet. And if I took a bunch full of vinegar and I said, oh, that's very sweet, you said to me, sweet. Sweet's bitter and bitter sweet. And we're supposed to listen to all this. That was in Isaiah chapter 5. Woe to them, God, uh, Isaiah said, to, God said to Isaiah. And I say, woe unto them today that are telling us such things and making us believe such things and telling our children such things and putting society into damnation. And we sit up and we take it all. We don't hear many voices raised against it, apart from the Catholics and abortion, doing far more than the Protestant church having prayer meetings. God help us is all I can say. That's all I can say. Martin Lloyd-Jones says 50 years ago, we're in a stage of progressive perversion. 50 years ago, progressive perversion. Friends, listen, I'm getting on in years, but you know there was a time when men and women that would have trifled with sins like these, they would have been ashamed. They would. There was a measure of shame, even in the ungodly. There was a measure of shame over, over things, some of those things there that I, that I have mentioned. They would have blushed. Their conscience would have gripped them. That I had a fear about them, even though I say again they were godless. There, were, there was a restraint in society. Women would have been ashamed to talk about aborting a child and killing a child. If it happened, they went away and done it, and nobody knew anything about it. But now, that's not the case, honey, now because we have progressed in our darkness. Sex outside marriage and living together uh, 50, 60 years ago were remote. Single parents had to flee away to have their children. But now, now, 
the gays and the transgender and adulterers and the pedophiles and the murderers. They're on the chat shows. They're writing books and ballads about their sin. It's no shame anymore. We're progressing, degressing in immorality at a rate you would have never thought of. When you take the tens and thousands and tens and thousands of votes that went out last Thursday, and this is not a political statement, went out last Thursday to three parties, and one of them a unionist party, and voted for them who, uh, who, who don't, who believe that the child should be aborted. When you think of that, look at the state our land's in. Unbelievable that a person could go into a booth with a pen, a Christian, never mind a Christian, a Protestant, never mind a Protestant, somebody with a conscience at all that knows of the slaughter of the innocent children that haven't got a voice from themselves, the wee innocent children in the womb, murder them, put a cross down, both for the boys that are doing it. I'll go to hell and all belongs to them. You're crossed tonight. Indeed, I am crossed because this message burned into my soul. If it were not for the mercies of God, we would be consumed. We're, we're tipping the edge of judgment. We're just tipping the balances now. Some of these days are going to go over. And if we're not for the mercy and for the grace and the goodness and the love of God and the restraint of the Holy Spirit of God and praying people who are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, God would bring judgment upon the nation. And he's tired of it. The answer to the situation in our nation, in our land, in our church today is the same now as it was then. Look at verse 2 of chapter 3. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, there should have been only one high priest by the way, this was Rome's doing. Tinker not and defiling the priesthood. There should have been only one high priest. And he should have been from the office of Aaron. And he was there until he died. And we're not going into that sort of after. Anderson Cave has been the high priest. Here's the bit. The word of God came on to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. Now, my friend, here's the remedy here. Here was the remedy in the Old Testament. And here is always the remedy. It's the word of God came to a man of God in a place with God filled with the Holy Spirit. You hear that now? He was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. His mother was filled with the Holy Ghost and his father was filled with the Holy Ghost. came to him in the wilderness. There were six, the, around where he lived, they tell us there were six stone houses. That was the village. Way up in the hill country. Remember, he, he, he ate locusts and wild honey. That's what he lived on. He, he pulled the camel's hair around him for mud floors and stone walls. And the word of the Lord came unto him up there. It didn't come to the Caesars in Rome. No, no. That's not what the answer is going to be, my friend. And it, it didn't come to the Caesars in Rome, and it didn't come to the Pharisees and the scribes and the, and the rest of them crowd in the temple either. No. Not going to come through the established church. It came to a man, a man alone with God for 20 years in the wilderness or the desert, and both are called both. For he was in the desert until his time for showing forth came. 
didn't come to the political world. It didn't come to the ecclesiastical world. It came to a man. God had his vessel prepared in the desert. John the Baptist, rough, rugged, rude, and ruthless as far as sin was concerned. Boy, we need a half a dozen John the Baptist let out into our land. Of course, they did not, not live long. Six months is all he got. They took the head of him. Here was a man like Elijah, not who he's patronized Elijah. Here was a man saturated in the Word of God, saturated in the Old Testament prophets. What scriptures he had. Saturated in what his mother and his father told him about, about the days they were living and then in the temple and the angel coming at the right hand of the temple and naming him, John, before he was even born. Boy, he mused on all this. Elijah and the prophets of Baal and the fire falling and the power falling. Many a day he would have wanted to break forth but he couldn't until God's timing was right. It was right now. And he comes on into the back door of this whole crowd. There were 12 Caesars and 6 Herods and a crowd of boys here named five of them, with four or five or six of them there. And they were the ungodliest, wicked, evil people that were ruling the land. But God had his man. God always has his man. He has his man. It's the fire must have burned within his soul. Here's a man, my friend, he had no degrees, he had no diplomas, he had, he had no counselling course. They're all doing counselling courses today. It's not more counsellors we need, or counselling courses we need. Here's a man came, and the fire was in his bones. Elijah and his father and his mother and all that he told them, the state of the nation and what God had done and why God had withdrawn and how God would answer was all burning in his soul. Now I want you to look at verse 2 very carefully. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God. Now I want you to notice this, this is very important came unto John. That's a very bad translation. That's a bad. King James is not perfect, you know. I could take you a dozen things in the, King James, in the Gospels on their own. King James is the best Bible, and it's the only Bible I use, and the Bible I recommend you to use. So it's not perfect, you know. It was translated by men. You watch that again there. The word of the Lord, here's what it should read, came upon him. Now that's different. The word of the Lord possessed him, immersed him. Actually the word is pressure. The word of the Lord came and pressurized him from above. It fell on him. How many ministers, how many pastors, how many preachers are going out on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, and on Wednesday night with the word of the Lord burdening them? Tell me now. Because there are two words for the word. Two names, the Logos. When it talks about the Logos, it's talking about the word from Genesis to Revelation. But that's not what it's talking about here. There's the Logos and there's the Rima. The Rima means the specific word. 
And I have said this many times from this pulpit, before we get up, or I get up in this pulpit, I need a specific word from God for Sunday morning and Sunday night. I need a specific word from God for you people tonight. And this was a specific word that came to John the Baptist from God. What do some of these preachers know about the word of God coming on them? What does many of these God Channel boys, and even in their own country, in their own evangelical churches, what do they know? How long do they wait and cry and howl between the porch and the altar and not move until God gives them a word? No, they run to the internet. They run to some old sermon. I was in a house when I was very, very young in the work of God. And I said to myself, Lord, may I never be like that. And I wasn't, wasn't in the, out in the work of God. I wasn't doing what I'm doing now. I was just going out into the work. I was in a certain house one Saturday night, and the pastor came in. I'm not name what, what denomination he called. There came a pastor into the house about 8 or 9 o'clock. And he pastored a big church. A big evangelical church, and it would surprise you if I told you. And I remember him saying to that man and wife and to us in that house, he says, about 10 o'clock, I better go and get something for Sunday morning. The next morning, Saturday night. I said, Lord, I never want to be like that. What was he doing all week while well, he was on board the governor's? He was running here and running there. The devil will let you do anything. The devil, young man, young pastor out there today, minister out there today, the devil will let you do anything but spend time in prayer and in the Word. And if you want a word for your people, you need to lie between the porch and the altar and you need to fast at times and you need to pray and you need to cry and you need to stay there should it be the Saturday morning. Because the people need fed and they need the word. They don't need something regurgitated. They don't need something of the internet or some other man's sermon. They need something burning in their heart. They need the word that, come, that comes on to them. Do they know anything about, my friend, it's an awesome thing when the word of God comes on to a man and possesses a man. There's no getting out of it. There's no getting away from preaching it. I done two mission over, missions over in shops between Edinburgh and Glasgow and both times your man took me up to the Kirk of Shots where the revival came and the open air communion service in the evening. It was it 1,500 or 1,600? I'm not sure. And God had laid a word on the man to preach and they were all gathering around and they were all, they were all ready and they were waiting on them, hundreds of them, hundreds of them. And the boy took to his heels and he ran and he says, I can't do it, I can't deliver it, I can't. It possessed him the word and came back and that the revival started and the kick of shots to that message, Livingstone's message. Oh, may God give us the rima. May he give us the rima. It says in verse 3, look, as he came. And he came indeed. He didn't run like some of the boys. I call some of the modern pastors the grasshopper Christians. This is going out wide and far. All right, you just take, lap it up. The grasshopper Christ, Christians, give them a wee prod and they'll hop. A wee bit of contention in the church and a wee bit of trouble in the church and they're away. 
They hop away to somebody else and they hop away with the sermons that they have and they preach them somewhere else and they hop away to somewhere else and somewhere else and somewhere around six or seven places. They just hop about and hop about and they split church after church, some of them, some of them, some of them split churches and they're playing golf tonight. And they're on cruises. Never filled with the Holy Ghost. Never lay before God waiting on the Word. Never had a burden. Never had a vision for the people. Not all of them. And there's an older generation of preachers and they've left us in a state in our land. And if the cap fits word, for I have to bring what God gives me to bring. He went into all the country about Jordan right to the back door of these men right into the very territory of Pilate and Herod and Philip and, and Trachonitis and all the Rabbeline and all. He brought right into the middle of them all with a word burning in his heart burning in his soul. Oh may God give us words burning in our soul. Because that's the only thing that's going to turn the tide in our land again. Men filled with the Holy Ghost, with a word coming upon them from God. He didn't come with a guitar. Nothing wrong with the guitar. He didn't come with modern courses and there's nothing wrong with the modern courses. He didn't come with a laptop or an iPad or sunglasses or a pocket hanky. He came with an old camel's hair pulled round him. What did he come doing? Well, you see the word and you don't get much of it today. And he came into all the country about Jordan, verse 3, preaching, hallelujah, preaching. He came preaching, not teaching. Preaching. Boy, we need a band of preachers filled with the Holy Ghost. Preaching. That was the remedy. God says, here's your man filled with the Holy Ghost, anointed with power, with the word from God. Preaching. Not fooling about and tinkering about and telling jokes. Making announcements half the morning. Preaching! Preaching what? Preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Listen. If a man or woman wants their sins forgiven and peace with God and assurance of heaven, they're going to have to, first of all, the first thing they're going to have to do is to repent. Repent. You don't hear much preaching on repentance. 30 years ago, Jimmy Armstrong wrote a wee book and called it The Missing Jewel. What's it not today? When did you last hear your pastor preaching on repentance, brokenness, turning, fleeing from your sin? Oh, oh, you couldn't offend the people. Well, this man's not one bit worried. And if you have the word of God filling you and possessing you, my friend, you'll not worry what men will think or say. And I don't care what you say. He came preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. That's the pattern for 300, that was the pattern for 300 years in the early church. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Turn, flee, run from your sin, be baptized. And then follow the Lord. Repent. Jesus says, except you repent, you all likewise perish. Paul says, God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Job says, I abhor myself in dust and I repent in dust and ashes. And that's only a small number. 
Repentance was the answer. Repentance of sin and turning away from their sin and obeying God in the waters of baptism was the answer. And it proved well for John. John didn't come in waving a banner or a flag or with a fanfare or with. John didn't come in with a prayer letter or tracts, and there's nothing wrong with them. He came in holding and crying. That's the word crying. He cried. He was a voice crying, shouting at the top of his voice in the wilderness. In the wilderness. Who would come and hear him in the wilderness? Thousands came to hear him in the wilderness. He didn't go knock on doors and tell them, listen, here's a wee track for you. you need to, God loves you, you need to repent. No, no, they came to him. Now, this is when God starts to move. This is when, 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 when God starts to move. He's in the wilderness. Prostitutes came, soldiers came. Harlots came. All sorts of people came. Kings came. Herod came. Herod the king. This Herod the king came. And what does it say about Herod? He heard him. And he heard him gladly. And he done many things. Because there's an attraction about a powerful preacher. That's why Sam Workman could get up and before a thousand people in the tents and go and there's See Rowley here, and there's others, Alan and others, hundreds, hundreds saved sometime at his mission. There was, there, was, there was power about him, there was anointing about him. He had a word from God. Mullen was the same, Nicholson was the same. There were men anointed, men with the word, men with power. Not guffing about like some of these modern boys. God help us. No, he, he came heralding. He came crying in the wilderness. And they went out from all areas. They went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about. They flocked. They flocked to the Jordan. They flocked into the wilderness. They flocked to hear him. Thousands of them. You see, John was not only a foreteller. He was a foreteller. He told what was going to happen in the future. He not only was a foreteller, he was a forth-teller. He told it forthright. But he also was a forerunner. That's his ministry. He was a forerunner for Christ. He came to prepare the way for the king. And we're coming to a close now. God sent him preaching repentance and baptism, and they were baptized in hundreds in the Jordan, where there was much water. There they were baptized. Are you baptized tonight as a believer? Don't argue with God. Don't remonstrate with God. Don't try to bring your own wee ideas into membership or into the baptism or anything. Else. Are you obeying God? That's the punchline. You be in God. They came in their thousands. He, he, his main ministry was a forerunner. He was, he was sent to make a way for the king. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. See verse 4. As it is written in the book of the word of Isaiah, the prophet saying... The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. The Lord is coming and he's coming and he's on his tail here. Hallelujah. But the things had to be straightened out before he came. And those things will need to be straightened out before he comes and revive them. Do you hear me now? I'll give that a minute to sink in. 
Don't be asking God for revival if you're not going to obey him. He giveth the Holy Spirit unto them that obey him. Look at the verses again. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare, this was the message he was preaching, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. The things need to be straightened out. Now watch this. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough shall be made smooth. And all the flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. Every valley, watch the shalls now. Watch your eye, keep your eye on it. Every valley shall be filled. Every valley shall be filled. What's a valley? Well, a valley speaks of a low place. It speaks of a down place. It speaks of doubting and despairing and oppression, oppression and depression and apathy. Are you in the valley tonight? Are you in the valley? Every valley shall be filled. And God can touch you tonight, you know. And if you're down and defeated tonight, he can touch you. If you're despairing tonight and doubting tonight, he can touch you. He can lift you up. You lost faith? Well, you're a candidate for this verse. The Lord doesn't want you like that when he comes. Every morning, and I say this before God, between me getting from the bedroom to the study, there's not a morning maybe for the last 10 years, as I walk through that house, that I quote Psalm 5 and verse 3. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning. And in the morning, I will lift up my head to thee, and I will look up. And I do just literally lift my head. I don't know what this day is going to bring, Lord. In the morning, that's a good, that's a good time. In the morning. To lift up your voice unto the Lord. Then it goes on to say that every mountain and hill shall, and there's a shall again, be brought low. Well, what's the mountains? What's the mountains that need to be shifted? Well, I can tell you there's mountains of pride. Haughtiness. Boasting. Self-righteousness. They must be leveled. They must be smashed. They need to be brought down for a broken and a contrite spirit he will not despise. Hallelujah. Bigotry. Bitterness. Backbiting. Are all mountains. 
in lives of God's people that needs to be leveled before he comes. Jealousy, greed, lust, arrogance need to be broken. Watch it again now. Watch this shall. Watch this. Watch this shall. Watch this shall again. And the hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight. There's a lot of crooked boys about. Maybe I'm as crooked as any of you. There's a fellow said about a policeman I used to work with one time. He says, Do you see that boy there? He's that crooked that he has to screw his socks on in the morning. <laughs> now, you'd be bad when you'd have to screw your socks. But it says here, the crooked shall be made straight. What will I say to you to that? What will I say to that? I'll say to you this. Flee and pay your bills. Flee and pay your debt and your taxes and anything that you owe. Anything you've been crooked about. Crooked husbands. Crooked wives. Crooked businessmen. Crooked bankers. Crooked elders. Crooked pastors. Need to be straightened. This is all the doctrine of repentance. And then it says after that, and the rough shall be made smooth. Oh, hallelujah. Boys, you wouldn't have got anybody more rougher than myself. Not too smooth yet. The Lord's still working. The drunkard, the drug addict, the gangster, the murderer, the sodomite. Glory to God. Do you know what God's going to do up at this mission up the road? God's going to take the rough. And he's going to take the vile. And he's going to take the wicked. And he's going to make them smooth. And they'll be as smooth as the five stones that came out of the brook that David had. And he'll send them forth to slay the giants. Hallelujah. I look at this meeting tonight, I look at others, I look at myself and I say, rough, oh rough. But God has a way of smoothing us out. And it's hard at times, you know, when the file goes on. Whatever it takes, the gangster, the murderer, the sodomite, the rough. God can move on. And verse 6 says, And all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. And then they said in verse 10, the people asked him, saying, he didn't, he didn't come to them. What shall we do? What do we do? What do we do? A woman rang me there a week or two ago. What do I do to get saved? Boy, I love to hear that. What do we do? He told them what to do. We haven't time to go into that tonight. But my friend, there's no Mickey Mouse preaching here. There's no, nothing here, only the raw word that came from this man. Oh, the, oh now you need to be preaching love. You sure do. Do you know what the Lord Jesus said about John the Baptist? There was none greater born of woman. Now that's going back to Moses, Abram. There was none greater than John the Baptist and he went to this wicked boy Herod and he faced Herod and he said to her, do you see that woman you're with? It's not lawful for you to have her.
Who no love hear? No, but there's truth. And so they put him into prison. Six months, they took the head of him. If you want to follow John the Baptist, then be very careful how you pray now. If you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost and you need a word from God and God gives you a word and he sends you out, you need to be... Listen to the boy, a young teacher in England last night where they put him out of the schools because he wouldn't identify a boy as a girl or a girl as a boy. They put him out. He was on the Pierce Morgan show. He interviewed him last night. Played a clip of him on the street preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. There's hope for England yet. This is what we're facing and this is what we're going to face. Evil good and good evil. We need to draw the, draw the line and no further. And all flesh shall see the glory of God. I believe it's coming. It's coming. If we can get these shalls sorted out, he'll come. And he lift us up out of it in the mighty blessing and mighty victory. Thank you for coming these nights. And may God bless his word to all our hearts.